What's up guys and welcome back to my channel. My name is Brandon Smith. I know I've been away for quite some time and for that I apologize, but I can explain. First, just after Christmas holidays, I got this little virus that seems to be going around the world and it laid me out for a solid week. Then after that, the province I reside in locked down for a good solid four weeks and with gyms closed, restaurants closed, everything like that, I just really lost the motivation. I pretty much just laid in bed for about four weeks. Just, just that, that bed right there. That's, that's the bed I laid in for about four weeks, in case you're wondering. But I am back now and I'm ready to give these cases the attention they so richly deserve, as well as the people that reside within them. So enough about me, let's get right into today's case. God, it feels good to be back. The day is Friday, January 28th, 2011. The song Grenade by superstar Bruno Mars is number one on the Billboard charts. The film No Strings Attached, starring Natalie Portman and Ashton Kutcher, is number one at the box office. And in just two days, the now very problematic Alberto Del Rio will win the first ever 40-man Royal Rumble in Boston, Massachusetts, securing his title shot at WrestleMania 27. Far across the Atlantic Ocean from Boston, in St. Sulpice, Switzerland, 43-year-old Matthias Shep is picking up his twin six-year-old daughters, Alessia and Livia, from the home of his ex-wife, Irina. It is Matthias's weekend with the girls, and the twins' anticipatory delight can hardly be contained as they slide on their winter boots in the foyer of their Swiss residence. The girls say goodbye to their mother as they bundle out the door and disappear into the back seat of their father's dark silver Audi. Irina is used to the tradition of missing her daughters every other weekend, as it has been this way since she and Matthias split just over a year ago but this weekend will be catastrophically different. This will be the last time Arena will see her daughters, this day in mystery. Friday, January 28th, 2011, in St. Sulpice, Switzerland, is brisk and bright. Milder than normal for late January in Switzerland, the daytime temperature reaches 5 degrees Celsius. The region is expected to avoid any precipitation that weekend, and with that in mind, 6-year-old Alicia and 6-year-old Livia are excited to explore the great outdoors with their father. Matthias Shep, the twin girl's father, is a Canadian-born engineer. In 2002, Matthias met the girl's mother, Irina Lucidi, an Italian-born lawyer. After only two years of dating, the two were married in July of 2004, in Ascoli, Piceno, Italy. Soon thereafter, the couple moves to St. Sulpice, Switzerland, an affluent suburb of the much larger Lausanne. Less than three months later, the couple would welcome their only children, twins Alessia Vara Shep and Livia Clara Shep. After the children are born, Matthias' ways harden and he begins to extend his control over even the most minor details. These changes in Matthias cause a new stressor in the relationship and in 2010, the relationship capitulates and the two go their separate ways. Matthias moves out of the family home, but stays in St. Sulpice, finding the proximity to his progeny irresistible. After picking up his daughters, Matthias stewards them to his abode a mere five minutes away. Friday, at the home of Matthias Sepp, is just like any other previous weekend with his daughters. He cooks the girls dinner, and the three discuss their weeks spent apart. Saturday is more of the same. Bonding and family time are the day's order. Sometime during that day, Matthias sends a text to Irina that reads, We are all right, we'll return on Monday. On Sunday, however, the mundanity is shattered. 
At 12.30 p.m., the girls are seen playing with the children of a neighbor in the front yard of the home before Matthias unceremoniously removes his daughters from the playdate and loads them into his vehicle. At 5.04 p.m., Matthias, Alessia, and Livia cross the border into France. As the calendar flips to Monday, January 31st, Irina, back in St. Sulpice, is awaiting the arrival of her daughters so she can take them to school. She has no idea that at this very moment, they are in a different country. At 12.30 p.m., Matthias Shep is seen on bank CCTV withdrawing money from several ATMs in Marseille, France. At 2.55 p.m., he is seen putting a postcard into a mailbox. CCTV never captures any images of the girls in France. At 8.40 p.m., the three board a ferry from Marseille bound for Corsica. During the boat ride, the calendar turns into February, and on the first of the month, the ferry arrives in Corsica at 6.30 a.m. Later that day, at 9 p.m., Matthias takes a ferry from Bastia in northeast Corsica, bound for Toulon. On the morning of February 2nd, at 7 a.m., Matthias arrives in Toulon, and at 9.13 a.m., he is photographed alone at a toll. At 2.55 p.m., back in Switzerland, Irina receives a postcard from Thomas, postmarked from France. The next day, on Thursday, February 3rd, at 12 p.m., Matthias is observed by a witness in yet another country. He is now in Naples, Italy. But there is still no sign of Alicia and Livia. At 10.47 p.m. in Serignola, Italy, a town two hours northeast of Naples, Matthias, still very much by his lonesome, throws himself under a train and ends his life. Police are called to the site of the suicide, and after just a cursory investigation, they determine that there is no foul play, and that this man willingly took his own life. But who is the man? Back in Switzerland, sick with uncertainty, Irina is frantic to determine the whereabouts of her daughters and ex-husband. After speaking with Interpol, Italian investigators prospect a connection between the dead man on the Italian train tracks and the missing fugitive from Switzerland. Irina is shown the gruesome photos of the deceased and confirmed that the man is her ex-husband. Her heart plummets as she imagines the possibility that her daughters met the same fate. Swiss authorities, however, are quick to ensure the now widowed woman that Matthias is the only person who was found on the tracks. But the question still remains, where are the girls? Irina and the Swiss detectives are on the first plane to Serignola. On Thursday, February 10th, they arrive in the Italian village. On that evening's newscast, they plead with the townspeople to come forward with information about her daughter's whereabouts. A cafe owner says he saw the girls with their father in Serignola just hours before he killed himself. Head investigator Alfredo Frabuccini says that police have viewed close circuit video footage from the cafe over and over, but had not seen Matthias or the girls at any point that day. Furthermore, he added that days of searching the Serignola area with sniffer dogs had failed to turn up any trace of the girls. Hope dims for Irina as investigators determine that the last time that the girls were definitively seen was on the ferry from Marseille to Corsica, almost three days before Matthias committed suicide. As the weeks go by, leads in Switzerland, France, and Italy pour in as the case makes international headlines, but nothing comes of it, and Alicia and Livia remain missing. Matthias Casper Shep was born in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada in 1967. According to his friends and family, he reminisced about the country of his birth fondly. 
In February 2014, Italian journalist Urko Rossetti, a reporter with a television program focused on missing persons called Laha Visto, said they received a letter from someone claiming to have worked for the company who printed the false documents that allowed the girls to be transported to Canada. As previously mentioned, in the time leading up to his suicide, Matthias had withdrawn money from several cash points in Marseille. The amount was substantial, 8,000 euros. In Bari, Italy, he mailed out a total of 10 envelopes to his wife. All but one of the envelopes contained money. Eight envelopes reached his wife. The seven containing money totaled up to 4,400 euros. The two outstanding envelopes were later found in defunct mailboxes that, unbeknownst to Matthias, were no longer in use. These envelopes contained 1,500 euros. When police found Matthias on the tracks, he had just over 100 euros on his person. Even if you factor in food, hotel, and travel expenses in the days leading up to his death, we still have a goodly amount of money unaccounted for. Police theorized that this money could have been spent on the purchase of illegal transportation documents for his daughters. The anonymous letter claims that payments were made by Matthias to unknown individuals before his death, providing for the passports and safe transport of his daughters to his home and native land. The letter claimed that in order to shirk suspicion, the girls were separated upon arriving in Canada. One of the girls was living in La Chute, Quebec, and one of the girls was living in Ottawa, Ontario. Furthermore, another reason for this theory is friends and family were adamant that Matthias was a loving and caring father, whose family meant everything to him. Roberto Mesticelli, a cousin of Irina, said he could not imagine him doing anything like this as Matthias was a twin himself. Most poignant, however, was the fact that even Irina testifies that in his living years, Matthias was never violent with she or her daughters. Rochetti and his team became so convinced of the letter's authenticity that they traveled to both Canadian cities named in the letter in search of the missing girls. When the team put feet to ground in Canada, Many of the local people reported to have seen the girls in the two towns, with one witness even claiming that she was pretty sure the girl was Livia. Ottawa police knew nothing of the missing Shep twins, nor the investigation, but at Urkel's behest, did agree to meet with the journalist. After meeting with Rochetti and hearing the details of the girl's plight, Constable Mark Susie said that if we do receive that call, yes, we will assist, or if we receive any evidence that these kids are in Ottawa, we will investigate. But no one has come forward with evidence they are, and no law enforcement agency has contacted for us for assistance right now. Matthias mailed out a total of 10 envelopes during his time in Bari, Italy. Nine of them contained only money, the tenth envelope contained only a letter. The letter, like the money, was addressed to Irina. The full transcript of the letter has never been released to the public, but the Italian newspaper Corriere della Sera was granted permission to publish a single sentence from the letter. The sentence is to confirm to read as follows. The children rest in peace. They have not suffered. Additionally, the original postcard which Matthias had sent to Irina from Marseille said he was desperate and could not live without her. In the weeks leading up to the January 28, 2011, Matthias made many disquieting searches on his workplace computer. Along with searching for the schedules of the various ferries he ended up taking that weekend, he also searched for information about firearms, poisons, and suicide. In fact, in the days leading up to that fateful weekend, investigators determined that Matthias Shep did little else but seek out this information and characterized him as a man possessed with these deviant searches. All right, so what do I think happened? 
So many times when I research these cases, you see examples of men who erroneously believe that they are unfairly put upon by their ex-wives, and as a result, perversely justify their actions, much to the detriment of their children. This is not the case with Matthias Shep. Seemingly, he still loved his ex-wife and considered Irina to be a great mother. Additionally, he seemed to be a man who acted only in the interest of his daughters. So why is it that I still believe Alicia and Olivia Shep are unfortunately no longer of this world? Because I believe that Matthias Shep was no longer of his right mind. It is because we know that Irina was a sound mother and Matthias knew this and because Matthias previously acted only in the best interest of his children, even in a best case scenario where he puts the girls in the care of someone else, we would have to consider this person to be acting contradictory to his prior values. So we have to also believe that something changed in Matthias. So when we consider his actions, we can no longer hold them under the microscope of the formerly conscientious guardian. In this new perspective, I believe that Matthias is a man that could do the unthinkable. Also, at a surface level, we know that in the days leading up to January 28th, Matthias was vehement in his internet searches. And while he feverishly queried the likes of poisons and firearms, not once in these lookups did he browse for terms like passports, fake passports, or travel to Canada. So unfortunately, I believe that Matthias's search history was as pointed as his intentions. Thus, on January 28th, 2011, he picks up Alicia and Livia. He spends the weekend with his daughters, trying to soak up every bit of sentimentality in their final days. On January 30th, he packs up his car and children and heads out on his sorrowful sojourn. On January 31st, he and the girls board the ferry to Corsica. In the evening, as he and the girls sit down to dinner in their private cabin, Matthias betrays the unwavering trust of his only children in the most fundamental way. He mixes a lethal amount of poison into their food, the girls finish their supper, and as the toxin takes effect, mercifully, the girls slip out of consciousness before their spirit leaves them. Matthias coldly loads the now deceased bodies of Alessia and Livia into two suitcases. He is premeditatedly designated for this very purpose. In the wee hours of February 1st, with a suitcase in each hand, Matthias quietly stalks his way to the rear of the ferry. Stoically, he angles the luggage over the ledge and simultaneously drops the shrouded bodies of Alessia and Livia Shep into the Mediterranean Sea. As the wake rises from the gruesome deposit, Matthias scans the deck for evidence of his discovery. Finding none, he returns to the cabin just days away from his very own death. Roberto Mesticelli, the cousin of Irina Shep and vocal spokesperson for the Lucidi family, says that they are devastated. When asked about the potential for finding the girls alive, he says grimly, there was never a thread of hope. There is no hope. Matthias's family holds a similarly fatalistic outlook, saying that they were united in the certainty that our son and brother could only have committed such terrible acts if he suffered a serious emotional breakdown. And while both sides of the family do not believe that either Alessia or Livia are still alive, they still have a desire for more information regarding their final days and what became of the twins. Thank you so much for listening to the story of Alicia and Livia Shep. Please like and subscribe. Weigh in on the comments below as in any of these cases, the more dialogue we can foster, the more attention these cases get. And the more attention these cases get, the more chance we have for a resolution. And just before I go, please remember that you are a wonderful individual who is capable of good. 
you are struggling right now for any reason, as a lot of us are, please remember that we are in this together and you are here for a reason. Please be kind to yourself and everyone you come in contact with. I'm Brandon Smith, and I'll see you next time.